Apple is releasing some brand new MacBook Pros. If you're thinking about buying one, then you definitely want to check out this whole video and see what might be a great fit for yourself. So this Tech Support Tuesday, I'm going to show you how to determine which MacBook that you might want to purchase with an M1, M1 Pro, or an M1 Max chip so that you don't end up blowing a bunch of money that you didn't have to. Let's get started. All right, so we're going to come up over to apple.com slash store and then click on map. Now, before I start to dive into this, it really just depends what you're going to be using your MacBook for that's going to steer you in a particular direction. So for example, if you're going to just be checking emails and doing plain office tasks on your machine, then a standard M1 processor is more than enough power for most applications out there, even if they don't run natively on the M1 ARM-based architecture and end up having to run through Rosetta 2, which acts as a translation layer between x86 and ARM architecture. It basically acts as a translation layer where the code originally was written for Intel x86 architecture and then emulates it over on Apple's new ARM architecture. The system will run hotter than normal, and if it is a system that has a fan, then the fan will most likely kick on due to all the additional work that it has to do to be able to run the software. Now stick around because I will show you a site that will show you what software is compatible as well. But first, let's figure out what Apple machine is the best for you. If you're going to just use it for plain office tasks, then really a MacBook Air is more than what you need for most people. Now, there is a seven core GPU versus the eight core GPU. Now you might be asking, how do you get a seven core GPU instead of eight cores? So how Apple does that is through a process that is called binning. Now binning is basically when they go ahead and take a processor and run it through different tests and say that there is a single core that is having issues, then they disable that core and then it becomes a seven core GPU. Then they toss it in the pile and end up still reselling it. Seven core GPU is gonna be plenty of power for most people, unless if you get into a lot of video editing, in which case then I would recommend going to the eight core GPU and possibly considering the MacBook Pro. Now the main difference between the eight core GPU on the MacBook Air versus the MacBook Pro that's the same size is that this has a fan and a touch bar. Now in the latest 14 and 16 inch machines, Apple did remove the touch bar and they also brought back a lot of ports. And as you can see right here, this is my M1 MacBook Pro and it just has the USB-C or Thunderbolt ports on one side and a audio jack on the other side. Now I do edit the majority of my videos on the M1 MacBook Pro and it is blazing fast. So if you're wanting to stick with a smaller budget under $2,000, then the MacBook Pro might be a good choice. But honestly, if I could purchase it all over again, I probably would have just went with the MacBook Air and got more storage for about the same price. Now let's move on to today. There are 14 and 16 inch and you have the M1 Pro as well as the M1 Max. Now even the eight core CPU on the M1 Pro will outrun the eight core CPU on the standard M1. And the reason for that is because more of the cores are big cores rather than small cores. And then of course, now you've got a 14 core GPU for the entry model, all for just under two grand. Now one mistake that I made when I ordered my latest 14 inch, actually there were two mistakes. So one is that I guess by default, it just comes with a standard uh, smaller power adapter versus the larger power adapter, but I'll see when it gets here. I just didn't pay attention to that. And I saw some people complaining about it, so I figured I might have overlooked that, but we'll find out in a few days. And the other possible mistake, and the reason why I say possible is because there might be a workaround for it, is that I guess the 16 inch has the ability to enable some kind of performance profile, which we suspect that it is probably just turning the fans up and overriding the default fan curve so that you can keep everything running cooler and have better performance. However, there is a possibility that there might actually be a lot more beefier cooling solution under the hood on the 16 inch. But either way, I hope that the 14 inch is more than enough performance for me for the next several years. But once I find out if there's a big enough difference in performance between the 14 and 16 inch, I might end up returning it and spending a couple hundred dollars more, but I would prefer to keep it smaller just so it's easier to travel with. Now we'll go ahead and scroll on down. So I'm gonna go ahead and just select either one of these. And what I did do before is I tried selecting each one and configuring them the same, and they ended up being the same exact price, which is great. But if you know like the Dell configurator online, when you're pricing out stuff, sometimes just making a different selection and still giving it the same components, you end up getting a cheaper deal. I guess Apple doesn't do this, which is nice. So I got the M1 Max 
with the 10 core CPU and 32 core GPU and just kept the 32 gigs and went with one terabyte of storage. Might have actually gotten the better power adapter. Now I'm gonna go ahead and configure it again, keep it as the M1 Pro. So it's about $900 more to go to the M1 Max and keeping the same amount of memory and hard drive storage. So one thing I noticed here is that if we even just jump up to the M1 Max here for the extra $200, watch the price. It'll jump a lot more than that, and you'll see why here. So when we click it, it forces you into 32 gigs of unified memory, and it puts you right over three grand. Now from some of the earliest benchmarks that have already been leaked already, as of today anyways, the performance is quite breathtaking, especially when editing videos. Now the original M1 is a very capable machine, as I love the one that I have. And if you just edit, say, like photos in like Lightroom and Photoshop, it's got plenty of power to do that. As I mentioned before, I was going to show you a website that shows you what runs natively on the M1 chips already, as well as what might not run so well or not at all. So if you come over to isappleSiliconReady.com, you can see up top here we have the key, we have the native M1 support, Rosetta 2 only, not working and not tested. So as we scroll down, there's a bunch of different uh, applications on here, and we can also go ahead and filter them as well. Now if we look at, say for example, Eclipse IDE for software development, it is not M1 optimized, but it is Rosetta 2 capable. So in other words, it will run, but it's gonna run your system a bit hotter and take up more battery as it has to go through that translation layer to emulate the x86 architecture. Coming back up to the top here, I'm going to click on browsers and most browsers are supported. Waterfox is not, but Firefox, Chrome, Brave, Safari. Uh, Safari, of course, definitely, since Apple made that. Now let's go over to development software. Postman, that's fully supported. SQLite, IntelliJ, IDEA, that's pretty nice. And it's funny that that's fully supported, which it is built off of Eclipse for an IDE, but yet IntelliJ got it working already. All right, now design, let's see what design software is supported. So Adobe Photoshop, of course that is supported already. Got Pixelmator and a whole bunch of other programs here. Pixelmator Pro, now we'll look at music software. And just so you know, I'm going to point out the obvious that most likely if the software was ever made by Apple to begin with, it was probably supported from the beginning of the original release of the M1 chip. So you can see Logic Pro and Audition are both fully supported. And let's look at the video production. I have not used Handbrake on this yet to see what kind of performance I get out of it. Drop a comment below if you want me to do a video on that as well. But I do use Adobe Premiere sometimes although usually I use Final Cut Pro. VLC, Blender, Camtasia, all currently support the M1 chip, and of course DaVinci Resolve. Now Topaz Labs, they make all sorts of cool uh, plugins and applications, not just for video, but also for photo. So I would like to see more of their software becoming M1 native, and I plan on actually purchasing their licenses this Black Friday when it goes on sale. OBS, sadly, is still running through Rosetta, Although it does run, it does not run as well as it could. And I would also like to see Plex Media Server. This would be interesting if it ran natively on an M1. wonder how many concurrent streams you could get out of it. Because you could just pick up a used M1 Mac Mini and connect it to network storage to be able to share out all of your video and audio content using Plex Media Server. Okay, so photo software. We already came across Photoshop under design. And then you've got Lightroom Classic and a handful of others, Affinity Photo. There's lots of different apps here that it seems like that for editing photographs and raw camera files that the majority of the applications out there in the Mac ecosystem are already supported by the M1. Now we'll take a look at productivity. VMware Fusion, that's kind of sad that uh, paid version of VMware that they don't have working yet natively for the M1 processors. Now Microsoft Teams will run, but it's not native. Same with Dropbox, but Zoom is. So if anybody from Microsoft is watching, get caught up to Zoom, because you might have some people that have Teams and Zoom, and they'll just prefer to use Zoom. But I will say that when I am running on Windows, I really do like Microsoft Teams. And even though Teams is not fully supported yet, Office 2019 is. Go figure. Now once my new system does arrive, I want to go ahead and compare it against the original M1 and see what kind of increased performance that I get by stepping up to the most powerful 14 inch model that's available this calendar year. So make sure you're subscribed so you don't miss that one and I'll catch you in the next one.